Okay, thank you all for coming. Uh, for, since time immemorial, uh, parents, religious organizations, public health officials, and generalized scolds have been trying to find a way to stop young people from having sex. Uh, now, it, it appears as they might have been a little bit too successful. Uh, over the past 20 years, uh, and especially recently, uh, rates of, uh, of sex among adolescents as in people in their early 20s as well as uh, have gone down, as well as the age of first sexual contact have gone up. Uh, so today we're here to talk about uh, the implications of that, whether it's good, whether it's bad, and why it might be happening. Uh, I'm Amanda Mall. I'm a staff writer at The Atlantic, and I'm going to be your moderator tonight. Uh, first, we have uh, Debbie Herbenick, who is an author, uh, sex educa educator, and professor at Indiana University School of Public Health, and also the director of the Center for Sexual Health. And she uh, has done a ton of research on this topic. Next to her, we have Kate Julian, a senior editor at The Atlantic Magazine, who wrote our December 2018 cover story, The Sex Recession, uh, based on a lot of Debbie's research. Uh, and then, finally, a man who, for many of you, I'm sure, needs no introduction. We have Dan Savage, a, uh, a tenured uh, sex and relationship <laughs> columnist uh, at The Stranger in Seattle. He writes Savage Love, and he also hosts The Savage Love Cast. Thank you all for being here. Uh, well, first, I want to know, how do we know how much sex people are having? <laughs> how do we figure that out? It's such a private thing. <laughs> yeah, so we, we ask them. So um, our team and... Uh... <laughs> and who would lie? Yeah, who would lie about yeah. that? Um, so all around the world, there are people like me who do um, what are called population-level um, health surveys, and we do surveys about sex, and so we ask all kinds of things about... Um, who's having sex, at what ages, how many partners, all of that. Um, so um, people have been doing this, again, in many countries, especially many industrialized countries, like the United States, the UK, Finland, Australia, and France. And what has come up is that at least some of these studies, um, not all, show some declines in sex among certain age groups. Um, and that's what, yeah, has sort of gotten us all here today. Okay. Um, what kind of decline are we seeing? How much is it? What age groups is it affecting? Is it a U.S. thing? Is it international? What's the exact phenomenon we're dealing with here? Yeah, so it uh, is a U.S. thing. It's also an other industrialized country thing. There are some countries within Africa that are showing increases in certain age groups that we think is because of better health, especially better treatment for HIV specifically, so healthier people. Um, you know, being, being better able to have sex and do a bunch of other things too. Um, and I think in the other countries, it's really sort of tricky, right? I mean, you're seeing some declines in some countries, mainly among adolescents. Other countries might have declines among the 18 to 24 year old groups. But they're, you know, again, it's like slightly different patterns depending on the country. But yes, the, you know, more of a decline and not an increase in any of these countries. Okay. Uh, like I mentioned in the intro, Ages of public health campaigns and religious rules have, have tried to discourage adolescents and young people from having sex too early. Uh, have, have, those, have those campaigns ha had anything to do with this? Are, the, is, are these numbers a success in a certain in a certain sense? Well, some aspects of this are clearly positive, right? I mean, the U.S. has long had a really problematically high teen pregnancy rate. And it's still much higher than it should be and higher than it is in many other wealthy countries. But it's at a historic modern low um, since the 90s. I think it's like a third of what it was. And when it started to decline in the late 90s, I think nobody really could figure out what was going on. Everybody was really happy about it. This was great news. Contraceptive access advocates said it was because people were using contraception more. And that was partially true, but didn't really tell the whole story. Abstinence advocates said it's the abstinence education, and subsequent research hasn't worn that out. And it starts to look like this might be an example of something good that's happening for maybe some not so good reasons. Quite a bit of research recently has looked at the way adolescence is changing and finds that teenagers are doing a lot of things that are associated with adulthood less. So drinking alcohol less, working outside the home for pay less, 
getting driver's licenses less, which actually might be sort of relevant here, because guess what teenagers have always done in cars. Um, <laughs> and if you look to countries like the Netherlands that have looked at teenage experiences really closely, they found increases in the age at which kids are not only having sex, but doing other things like holding hands or kissing for the first time. And some observers, particularly in the Netherlands, are really troubled by this because they say, look, like, if people aren't doing these things that reflect connection with other people broadly, are they not getting certain experience they need for adulthood more broadly? Right. And not preparing for adulthood. Uh, my observation, yeah. when you came on my podcast, I yeah. think we talked about this, uh, was that I looked at this research and what, what people were saying about how uh, young people are waiting to become sexually active, waiting to have their first relationships um, until later in their adolescence or into their 20s. And this, to me, sounds a lot like what it meant to be gay forever because our straight siblings and peers were dating in middle school and dating in high school and encouraged to date in middle school and high school, um, by, not just by the culture, but even by their parents. Uh, whereas if you were gay, you didn't do that. You didn't date in high school or middle school. You uh, edited the student newspaper and you edited the yearbook and you <laughs> were in the plays. <laughs> and so we would, you know, it's very common for gay people and, and lesbian people uh, to have their first relationships in college, uh, in their late, late teens, early 20s, and, you know, 30, 40 years ago when it was much more common for uh, gay people to come out after college to have those first relationships in young adulthood, you know, 24, 25 years old, and to have to make all the mistakes at 24 that your siblings made at 14 and learn all the same lessons and try to make up for that ground at, the, at a time when it was more perilous to make those mistakes because you didn't have parental uh, help or intervention if you needed it. You also had your own apartment, a car, and a credit card. You get in a lot more trouble. <laughs> But we managed to make that work. And right. so when I hear about, you know, people are delaying, they're getting started in relationships later, I don't think, oh my God, this is a disaster. I think, welcome to being gay, and <laughs> it'll work out for you. It worked out for us. Well, and I think there's actually something really important that we have to acknowledge about all of these data in all of these countries is that they're population level data, which means that they are basically lining up really well with what the straight people in those countries are doing, right? Because straight people make up the bulk of the population, right? So they're nationally representative studies. And we reproduce ourselves out of your bodies. That's it's right. kind of magic. That's right. But so, it's, but so, I mean, it, none of these have been broken down by sexual orientation, right? So they're only broken down by age group. And most of these data aren't even specific. So, for example, some of the US um, data, which come from the General Social Survey, um, asks questions like, you know, how often in the past 12 months have you had sex, right? It's like literally just had sex, which means so many different things to so many different people. When we do our research, we ask like very specific questions about like anal and vaginal and vibrators and, um, you know, everything, right? All kinds of different things. Um, but a lot of these studies have been pretty vague. Um, to give you some other ideas about what the general social survey asks, because I think it's still so messed up that, that they do this. <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're focused on trends over time. And so... They, I understand that they want to compare, but it means that even in recent years, there are still questions in there like, um, you know, what are your feelings about like same sex people having, you know, sex or, or people having sex with people of the same sex? Like, always wrong, sometimes wrong, um, wrong, like, uh, you know, like a little bit wrong, or not, or not, not at all wrong. wrong those in a those fun are way. like literally the options. Wrong like, is the frame. Yeah, there, yeah, there's no option that's like none of my business or like amazing, you know, like there's or nothing. Or I'm like having that. sex with somebody of the same right. size. Right. None yeah. of this. You I know, think and it's great. It's, it's just, and it's the same stuff for like, you know, questions about like attitudes about sex outside of marriage, like always wrong. It's like, it's, it's yeah. a weird survey. The porn um, question is really weird, right? The, they mean, ask, like, <laughs> have you seen an X-rated movie in the past year? Which I'm guessing to most 20-somethings means very little. Yeah. 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 And, and so it's like, yeah, so these questions, because they were asking yeah. this way in the 80s, like, they keep asking it that way. So there's also just some other things that, that make it, I think, for me, as a scientist, tricky to say um, with any confidence that mm -hmm. that's as stable as we think it is. I'm also curious if that breaks down at all by like socioeconomic status or ethnic group or region within the United States. Do we have any data on if this is like a problem among more affluent 
teens or less affluent teens, or do we know? Yeah, so, and again, it's not just teens, right, that the real can. It's like, you know, young adults, too. Um, So at least in the U.S. and the U.K., it's not surprisingly um, more, you know, there are some economic ties, right? So people who generally are higher socioeconomic status tend to be having more sex. Um, And especially for, like, young men without money, you know, less likely to have jobs, are generally having less sex. Okay. Okay. It seems to me that the one of the obvious possible explanations is access to technology, pornography, um, that people are sublimating their desires um, or satiating, or, you know, sating their desires with porn and tech in a way. Like this generation where the sex has been dropping off over the last 20 years, it's the first generation to come up with you know, access to the internet 24 hours a day and it wired into their heads. Yeah. And the pleasures of that and the rewards of that may be displacing the, the pleasures and rewards and effort required to actually get someone to go to bed with you when you can get on the I internet mean, and get the world to go to bed with one you. One of my favorite economic <laughs> studies that relates to this is very clever. It looked at the bro- sort of when broadband internet was introduced to different counties across the country and then tried to correlate that with teen pregnancy rates. And it found that that alone accounted for like 13% of the decline in teen pregnancy. Wow. Which and, and yet we talk about this like it's a problem when I'm old enough to remember when the constant sex panic was, kids are having sex, this is terrible. <laughs> and now kids are <laughs> masturbating instead of having sex, this is terrible. Right. And statistically that's true. The, uh, as rates of adolescent and young adult sex have declined, rates of, adult, uh, rates of masturbation in the same groups or reported masturbation, people lie, um, have gone up. And uh, I think, like he said, that's tied to the availability of pornography, to the normalization of masturbation and sexuality. And uh, I was wondering if masturbation and sex, do they trade off or are they both influenced by you know, isolation and pornography and things like that? Well, it is a concern if technology takes the place of interpersonal relationships, Mm -hmm. because it's a poor substitute for interpersonal relationships. But like the research you studied, there there are benefits to this. Uh, You know, teen pregnancy going down. Also, rates of sexual assault have gone down. When I went to college in the 80s, the chant was, porn is the theory, rape is the practice. And as uh, the internet became available, county by county, state by state, as it came online and internet pornography became accessible to everyone, rates of sexual violence where the internet porn was available would fall, mm-hmm. not rise. And so there may be some benefits. There may be some people sitting at home masturbating. We would rather be sitting at home masturbating <laughs> than going out and trying to find partners to endure sex with them. That is true. Uh, at, the, at the opposite extreme of, uh, of pornography and masturbation, though, I think you sometimes get people who are diverting what might be healthy energy away from partners and towards themselves, literally. Um, and do you think uh, in your research or in your research for the article, have you found that that is at all a problem? That, that masturbation is substituting for sex? Yes. Um, So Debbie can probably speak to the research on this a little bit more. I know that some sex therapists that I spoke to think that it can be the case that masturbation can sort of take the edge off your desire to the point where you might be bringing less desire to a partner. Mm -hmm. And that did come up in some of my conversations with younger people as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, some people certainly feel that way, but I I always think it depends, right? Like if you don't feel like you want a partner, then like who cares, like masturbate. But yes, if like what you really want is to, to go find somebody, I mean, it is true that sexual desire is a motivator for many people. So some people worry that like, well, if you're not having like that extra um, sort of push from your own arousal or desire that would motivate you to maybe like get out and actually meet somebody or use your apps to go and meet somebody, whatever, then that maybe you're not getting what you want if you're wanting to find like a human in the flesh partner. Right. Right. And there are certain things people used to have to do to attract a partner, most of which fall under the heading, get your shit together. <laughs> get a job, get an education, get an apartment, have a place. And if you don't need to get your shit together to satisfy yourself sexually, because you don't need a partner anymore necessarily, mm-hmm. with tech and now you know masturbatory technology, vibrators and, and now insertable toys for men, mm-hmm. uh, maybe there'll be fewer people in this country with their shit together than there already are, which is terrifying <laughs> to contemplate. I mean, 
I also think a big part of this is shit together related and economics specifically. I mean, if you look at people under 35, the most common living arrangement now is with your parents. That's probably not super conducive to an awesome sexual or romantic life. And frankly, if you're in the situation where you're living with your parents, your first priority financially may be not dating, which can be really expensive, but maybe saving up money so that you're not living with your parents. Right, and that goes hand in hand with the rising rates of uh, anxiety and depression among uh, young adults and adolescents. What influence do you think that has on, uh, on their interpersonal activities? Yeah, well, we certainly know that for most people, anxiety and depression keep them closer to home, right, and keep them not wanting to go to meet people. There's a small percentage of people who, when they have high anxiety or when they're depressed, they actually um, almost sort of self-medicate by, by wanting to be sexual with other people, but that's a tiny percent. So more often it's going to keep and them And the medications away from that we partner. prescribe to people who are anxious or depressed are usually libido, if not killers, underminers. Mm -hmm. Kind of a lose-lose. Yes. Sorry? It's kind of a lose-lose in that yeah. regard, yeah. And it seems like sort of a vicious cycle. The, you know, the, the, the more anxious you are, the less sex you're having, the less sex you have, the more depressed you might feel, you know. The it, more meds you need. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it seems self-enforcing. But you know, there's also so many amazing things happening with young people now, too. Mm -hmm. So I teach college students at IU, at Indiana University. Um, I teach a human sexuality class, so my students are not, I don't ask them to write about their own sex lives in their papers, but almost all of them do. And, um, <laughs> and I have about 100 students every time I teach. And I think one of the things that I've noticed that I find just fascinating, especially with the young men, is that more and more young men talk about delaying having sex for the first time, or even if they've had sex once or twice, delaying it again until they find somebody who they really like. Mm -hmm. And what I find really interesting about it, I mean, it's almost all of the men who take my class now. Not all, almost all. Um, but there's, they seem to be resisting some stereotypes about like young men and masculinity. And that's good for them, like they feel like that's the right choice for them, mm -hmm. but they're not yet comfortable enough to admit this to any of their friends. Oh. So like paper after paper after paper has these, these descriptions of the young man, like I'm so weird because I have I like feelings, or I'm so weird because <laughs> I want to find somebody I like. And it got to the point like in, in the fall semester when I was teaching this class, I started writing like the same thing to so many of them that I that I opened up like a Word doc and like wrote it out and copied it and I would just like paste it and paste it into paper after paper because I just had so many men who felt weird for just wanting to connect with somebody else but were actively making choices to like decline sex that they that like that they had open to them um, but I thought it was really neat that that they were kind of finding their own way. Um, and that maybe this is a middle ground to maybe at some point in the near future where more men will feel, you know, more straight guys in particular feel comfortable saying this to each other. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's fascinating and I, I don't know why that is. I'm attributing it a little bit to maybe the way that we've opened up just understandings about like gender and sexuality in recent years that maybe give some of these men more permission to do that. But to the extent that that might explain even like small bits of this decline, like I think that's a really neat way of um, helping people just find the sex lives that they want. Right, right. Um, yeah, and we should say this is not necessarily like an entirely negative decline. We're talking about the negative stuff right now, but people having the sex they want to have is great. And even the declines <laughs> we see, like they're all small, right? So right. sometimes like we get these, these calls, um, you know, from journalists, and what I really liked when Kate called is like it wasn't like a panic, you know? Like we heard from some writers who were just panicked that sex was declining. Mm -hmm. And I loved, you know, in your piece, how you just sort of like took it through all the different possible things that might be going on. Because life is really rich and nuanced and people make lots of different choices for lots of different reasons, but we're certainly not in a sex panic. Right. Um, and what you were saying about your young students struck me that uh, I'm a millennial. Among my friends, I know that a lot of them are, have sort of pulled back from the, the lure of like hookup apps because they, you know, we've all experienced what that is like and found it sort of unsatisfying uh, and hard to you know, have good sex with a random person who doesn't know you and you don't trust. Uh, so what, do you, what impact do you think that has on this phenomenon? Sort of like we, we've experienced and now we're re-evaluating maybe? The grinder Tinder of it all? Yes. <laughs> So, you wrote about that a lot in your yeah, piece. Yeah, no, I did, I did write about this a fair amount in the piece. One thing that was really surprising to me is when you try to kind of get data on this stuff, how 
ineffective and ineffectual, a lot of apps for, for a lot of people. So for some people, they work really well. Um, I think particularly people who are looking for casual sex, people who are really conventionally attractive, they're awesome. And this is, if that's your thing, like your golden age. <laughs> I think for a lot of other people though, they can be really inefficient and time consuming. I think the last time that Tinder released this data, which they have wisely, for their own sake, stopped releasing, the average user was spending like an hour and a half a day on the app, which is a tremendous amount of time. And if you were spending that time doing other things, like you might be- looking at Twitter. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of sort of old fashioned things. Um, you might be making more human connections. The other point I think is just like how inefficient that time is. So one guy I talked to who was really, he sort of described himself as a nerd on this, started like calculating his numbers and he's like, I'm swiping 300 times to the right for every woman I have a text exchange with, let alone get a drink with, let alone have sex with. Now clearly that's not everybody's success rate, but some other numbers I looked at suggested that's actually probably more typical than not. And I think also people are using it sort of as a digital distraction or diversion. The problem is that because it's become the sort of accepted way to meet people, especially if you're in your 20s, I think it's having effects on sort of how acceptable it is to express sexual or romantic interests <laughs> in other contexts. A lot of people told me like, I don't know if I can really ask somebody for their number, like that's kind of not really the way to do it, it might be inappropriate, I might offend them, it might be awkward, like fear of awkwardness was a big thing. One woman I really loved um, talking with sort of said, this has been really great for me as somebody who's socially anxious because it's really scripted and I know going in that if I'm interacting with somebody on this platform that they're looking for the same thing that I am, and that takes some guesswork out. But she observed, I thought, very, with great, great self-awareness that as time went on, it was making it harder and harder for her to do that same kind of thing outside of an app. And, and I think that's, yeah. there's a little bit of a, a contradiction there in the culture when we panic about people, and I'm not saying you're panicking, but you know, we worry about people only you know, wanting, you know, thinking they could approach someone or hit on someone on these apps, while at the same time we're trying to create a culture where you don't hit at people on work, hit on people at work, you don't hit on strangers exactly. on the bus or the subway, you don't walk up to women on the street and say smile, but we, so we need these places where by dint of entering them, yeah. you are giving everyone permission to approach you in this space. There are certain kinds of bars and clubs where it's understood you're in that kind of bar or club and you've chosen to yeah. be in that, you've made a choice to be in that kind of bar or club and people can approach you. They're not assholes for approaching you. They're assholes for not going away when you make it clear that you're not interested in their approach. And so, you know, I think dating apps can be a net positive. It can be a real time suck and you have to have some self-discipline around how often you use them and how much of your time you sink into them. But broadly and for the culture, I think they're making our workplaces <coughs> resemble what we say we want them to look like, which is less, you know, a sexual marketplace, which it shouldn't be at all because we all carry a sexual marketplace around with us in our pockets. I can't tell you the number of people I know, um, particularly gay guys, because I hang out with a lot of gay guys, who will see somebody attractive and then open their phone and see if they're on Grindr. <laughs> not go up to them, okay. because going up to them might like bother them, they might right. have a partner, they might not be interested right now, but if they're on Grindr too, even if they're in the same room or park or whatever, in an environment where if you wanted to meet somebody, you just have to go talk to them, mm -hmm. you, se you send out that indication you can approach me in this space, digitally and virtually, mm -hmm. and that can be good. Mm -hmm. right. um, I'm wondering, since we're, a big trend is delaying the age of first sexual contact, not just people having less sex. Uh, what kind of impact does that have once people start having sex? Like what, the, you know, delaying for a couple years, delaying to college when you might have had sex in high school in previous generations, or delaying till after college when it might have been in college. What, what happens then? How does that affect someone's sexuality over their life? Yeah, so overall, it's um, about being on track or off track. I mean, we're talking about like as a whole, right? For every individual person, it's going to be different. But as a whole, generally, if people are sort of like within the range of average-ish, then it's associated with like fewer problems later on sexually. Mm -hmm. So like really, really young, really, really older tends to be associated with more problems. But you know, I've never been convinced with that research that it means that those early ages or older ages are what's making you have sexual problems later right. on, but 
generally, like if you're waiting till you're 30 anyway to have sex, it might be because of like a lot of anxiety, right? right. Or there like other things. Other things. And same thing with like having like very, very early sexual debut. So I think it's complicated, but certainly like the slight increase in um, age at sexual debut, as we call it, is not at all concerning to me. I mean, it's, it really hasn't gone up that much. Right. It's, just, it's just a little bit. Right. Yeah. Um, but there is research that shows that the longer you wait to become sexually active, the likelier you are to have sexual dysfunctions. If you're, if you're, if you're like, if you're way up, way there. out there, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, you publish so get you know, it's like, <laughs> like you know, there's there's a cutoff, right? It's like it's just everyone like, wants like seventeen mind. in four months. That's the right moment. <laughs> everyone wants that like the data to be boiled know, down like, to. When I go talk to high schools, that's what they ask me. Like, at what age should we be having sex? Like, you know, there is no age like that, right? But. But when you're ready and you feel safe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you published some research recently uh, about uh, scary sexual experiences and experiences that might be traumatic. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but your, your research found those to be relatively common, especially among young women. Um, how might how do those come about? Well, the ones that aren't like starkly illegal, but just sort of like painful or uncomfortable or fear-inducing in some way. Uh, how did those impact? somebody's sexuality going forward? Is that, is that something that could be a, a cause of some of this change? Yeah, probably. So we, we recently published a study um, about people's experiences of feeling scared during sex. It was from a nationally representative um, survey of thousands of Americans, ages 14 to 60. And we found about a quarter of the women, and I think it was maybe around like 12% of the men reported um, some type of experience that where somebody had done something during sex that made them feel scared. And it's, the, it's actually the hardest paper I've ever had to write. I mean, when my graduate student and I were writing it, we would just sort of like, you know, not do anything on it for a while, because it was just really hard to read people's stories about the, we asked them to give examples. And what was hard about it, what for me especially was, um, you know, there were certainly ones that, again, were like patently, like obviously everybody would agree this is assault or rape. They described it as such. But there were a lot of other ones. For example, women would say things like, um, you know, sex was really painful and I asked my partner to stop and he said, um, hold on, you know, um, rather than actually stopping. There was a lot of like not stopping when it's painful. Um, there was a lot of um, choking. Uh, and it's not, you know, some people choke consensually, pleasurably. But this was clearly choking that like nobody had talked about and it just got sprung on somebody. There was one man who what, what scared him was that his partner asked him to choke her and that just, you know, again, hadn't been talked about ahead of time and it freaked him out because he was afraid he was going to hurt her. So I think what was really hard though is that there were also just, it was so gendered, right? So even though we categorized everything and both men and women described things, uh, for example, like in the contraception and condom category. But um, men's examples were things like, you know, partway through sex, I realized I forgot to put a condom on, and that was scary. Women's were more like, you know, it was in the 80s, and I had an HIV-positive partner, and, you know, I wanted to use a condom, and he wouldn't let me, right? So it was more about, like, coercion or, like, force or, like, you know, he took off the condom midway and, like, made me have sex. So there's some really, you know, really hard-gendered things. You know, we want to do the next step in the study, which is, like, how did this change things for you? Um, and I think it could probably go lots of different ways, right? I mean, there are some people who probably have some scary experiences regardless of their gender or sexual identity. And then they start making some different choices, right, that maybe help, uh, maybe they're less adventurous, they try to stay safer, that has its own ups and downs. Um, there are some others who may not actually be that traumatized, right? Like they pick up, they learn, they move on. And others who probably stay a lot closer to home. One of the things when Kate was writing this article that I mentioned um, that I thought, again, I think there's lots of reasons sex may declining, be declining, but I do hear from a lot of people, we see it in our research and I see it from my students where um, some kind of, yeah, some scary stuff is happening and I'm just not convinced that if enough scary stuff happens that you that easily go back for more, mm -hmm. right? That like I think something in you is gonna say, let me be a little bit more cautious or be thoughtful about my partner or take this next one more slowly. Um, because we are seeing, um, we see elevated rate. We see, for example, adolescent women, 13% of 14 to 17 year old sexually active girls have already been choked. Um, we didn't used to see that, right? So um, in our campus sexual assault cases, a lot of the sexual assaults now center around choking. 
Um, you know, we've had the, the sexual assault um, victimization officers who will say things like, we never saw choking before except in intimate partner violence cases. And now they just see it in like lots of first time hookup sexual assault charges. And that's porn. And, you know, I think it's porn and I think it's like Fifty Shades of Grey stuff, right? Like I think simultaneously we had different sexual, you know, a lot of different kinds of sexual explicit media um, that was really being embraced by all genders, right? I mean, Fifty Shades of Grey was very female targeted, although men, you know, read and watched it too. I know some of us, that was a casualty as both being <laughs> sex columnists and researchers that we, had to read, that we had to read that book. Um, but I... I <laughs> you know, but actually, I don't want to lay the blame entirely at porn's feet because we've abdicated right, our responsibility not. to provide kids <laughs> with comprehensive sex education that is porn aware and porn conscious. Right. Porn is a fact and its ubiquity is a fact and the genie is out of the bottle and we can't pretend and people do see things in porn that then they either want to experience or they believe is expected of them yeah, right. in the sex act, which is often a pressure on boys that I think is unacknowledged, mm -hmm. that they watch porn and think, I don't want to do that, but that's what I have to do because that's what she expects from me. Actually, if you've seen the new HBO show Euphoria, mm -hmm. they had a really good scene that involved choking to kids who liked each other were getting together and the boy started choking the girl and she was upset and then he was upset because he didn't do that to hurt her, he did that because he thought that's what right. women liked because that's what he'd seen and no sex education gets between young people and porn and says, and, and complicates that and says there are things that are gonna be portrayed that aren't expected, that porn isn't real sex, that it has to be consensual, that there has to be a negotiation. And what I thought was so smart about that scene in Euphoria, did you guys see it? Mm -hmm. Was part of what she, they, they said when they had this brief, intense conversation about it was, she says, well, if I had asked for it, it I wouldn't have freaked out. Mm -hmm. And he, he understands that, right. but he should have, you know, they're fictional characters, but in an ideal world, a boy in that circumstance would have heard that before he got to partnered sex mm -hmm. about what he'd seen in porn. Right, and it seems like we've mainstreamed a lot of uh, sexual behaviors like choking, BDSM stuff, things like that, that, that we haven't at the same time mainstreamed uh, any messaging about how to be a good partner or a communicative partner or a sensitive partner. Uh, we've mainstreamed kink, but we haven't mainstreamed the culture of kink, right. which is right. a culture of negotiation and consent obtained in advance. Right. And that's the thing, like when I first started teaching human sexuality, like people have always been into everything you can think of, right? Mm. Always. But like if you used to be into like kink, you would like, like in my town, Bloomington, Indiana, where we live, right? Like there are like munches, there's like groups, there's workshops, stuff like that. Like I could connect students with resources, I, with people. They learned like safe, sane, and consensual. They learned to talk. They learned these conversations. And then I just think it's like porn and Fifty Shades of Grey, and it's all just out there, and nobody's talking to them in schools. There's not a lot in families, especially around these behaviors, right? You might get like, use a condom when you have sex, but most parents don't, like, wouldn't even know, oh, I should talk to my 14-year-old about choking, right? right. Um, and so, like, I get that generationally you didn't know that, but, like, it would be a great conversation to have. We have a paper that's coming out now that actually shows on some different levels, but more about, like, safer sex stuff that like when you have like parents who are talking with their, their kids about safer sex issues, condoms, STIs, all of that, it interrupts the porn effect, right? So mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the young people, it's the adolescents who don't have those conversations with their parents who are, and who watch the porn who are more at risk for not having safer sex. I mean, I think another aspect of this is people who haven't had those conversations having really unrealistic senses of female sexual response and what sex should feel like. So I talked to so many women who said that their early sexual experiences had been with men who thought from what they'd seen in porn that what they needed to do was pound away. Possibly there might have been some non-consensual anal penetration that they weren't ready for. And that the combination of those two things was really unpleasurable. One of the stories that I heard that really sort of I found heartrending um, was of a physician at a university health center who talked about how they were seeing more and more cases of women coming in with like vulvar fissures, something that you might expect to see like in a sexual assault case, but the women were not saying they'd been raped, they just were having sex that they didn't desire. And they didn't actually know that it was supposed to feel different than that. But we don't center pleasure in sex education particularly for women. And so even young women, I hear from them all the time, 
will be sexually active. It will be consensual, technically, and yet it won't be pleasurable for them at all, and they don't even themselves expect that it should be pleasurable for them because female pleasure isn't acknowledged uh, in sex ed. As so as pleasure itself isn't acknowledged in sex ed. Most sex ed is reproductive biology. And Maybe what, some disease prevention. And disease prevention, uh, you know, how to make a baby, how not to make a baby. Any idiot can make a baby. Bristol Palin made two. <laughs> And the, but the weird people get tripped up with sex is, how do I talk someone into having sex with me? How do I make sure the sex we're having is mutually pleasurable? Mm -hmm. That's what we don't teach. Uh, I've always compared it to a driver's ed class where they teach you how the internal combustion engine works and don't teach you anything about steering or brakes or stop signs or turn signals. Mm -hmm. And so the first time you get in a car, you're gonna run somebody over. And that's our sex ed. Here's how your reproductive internal combustion engine works. Good luck. <laughs> And people run each other over, and it's usually the boy running over the girl. Mm -hmm. We found in one study of 1,000 women um, ages 18 plus, so the oldest one in the study was about 92, I think, um, that on average women were sexually active with a partner for a decade before they first felt like a partner valued their pleasure. A decade. I mean, that's... <laughs> I'd love to actually do that same study with men. We haven't yet, but a decade. There's something I think time. gay people can give straight people. <laughs> which is something we have uh, by dint of, you know, plumbing and mechanics. Uh, and it, I call it the four magic words. It's the question that's always asked when two guys are going to go to bed together for the first time. What are you into? Because it can't be assumed. And straight people default to vaginal intercourse because that's what straight sex is. And so when straight people get to consent, they stop talking about what's next, about what they want to do. And when gay people get to consent, that is the beginning of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Not because we're magic, not because we're better, but because we <laughs> have to keep having that conversation. And straight people and you know, people who have opposite sex acts often avoid that conversation. Mm -hmm. And they need to have it. What are you into? Ask each other that. Right, right. Um, I'm not other... into being choked. I'm not into being <laughs> anally penetrated without any proper consent. I'm not into <laughs> taking 10 years for you to get me off. <laughs> I have one more question, but we're gonna do, we're gonna flip to Q&A after this, so be thinking of yours. People will come around with mics, just FYI. Please keep it short. <laughs> um, uh, but I wanted to ask what, uh, you know, changing gender norms are, are clearly at, at play in a lot of these issues, and uh, how much does it impact these numbers potentially that women may feel, especially older young adults who have had sexual experiences and maybe decided to have a few less uh, or a few fewer, uh, that they might now feel empowered to say no to sex they don't really want to have, where in the past, you know, you just lie back and think of England. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we do, we do see, um, you know, we're seeing like slightly bigger portions of people saying that they want the sex more that they're having, that it's more pleasurable. Um, so again, I think, you know, this is not all bad to me. I think there's a lot of good. And if people are being more selective about the sex that they have and focusing more on quality. I mean, also some of these studies are looking at, like they're comparing the 80s to now, right? Like marital rape was legal in the 80s. So just because like that number was a little higher, like that doesn't mean to me, I mean, this is the other thing is like, what means the earlier number was the right number? Right. I mean, I think like it's not about numbers to me. Like are people ultimately having the sex that they want? And I think that's the question we need to always be asking ourselves. And not having the sex they don't want right. to. Not, yeah, right. like that you feel like you can say no to some stuff or you can say later, you can say not that, I'm not into that, right? Yeah, maybe tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, or maybe just the other thing, you know, that we right. do sometimes, but not this thing that you're offering me tonight. Right, right. Yeah. Do we have mic runners? Thank you all for doing this, and I do have a question for Debbie. I have a friend who teaches ethical leadership, and he's walking on eggs all the time with students in the environment of safe spaces, trigger warnings, that kind of stuff. How do you teach sex on college campuses without kids losing their minds? <laughs> Well, you know, it is an elective for almost everybody who signs up. And, you know, it's very clear, at least the way I teach it in my syllabus, I mean, these are all the topics. And, 
you know, if, if you're not ready, you know, for this, to, to be in this classroom and for these topics, I mean, at least where I teach, we have, this class has taught like eight sections of it every semester. I say, look, we've got great counseling resources. We've got this, we've got this, we've got this on campus. It will be offered again in the semester. But, you know, what I've learned about content warnings and trigger warnings is that they're not always what people think that they are, right? People always think that, um, that students might get very upset on the days that we talk about sexual assault because they've had, you know, they have histories of assault. And that's true. Sometimes there's, you know, a student who says, I don't want to be in class that day, and that's fine. But very often the things that are upsetting to students are the things that are upsetting to all of us, right? Like, you have a, you're having a, a really rough time um, because of a breakup. I mean, I will say, actually, for the students who ask me to sit out of a class, it's the day we talk about love and relationships. And it's, it, it's because somebody has either just gone through a breakup or is contemplating a breakup, and they'll say, I'm so sorry, can I just, I just don't think I can bear to sit through a class about love today. I mean, imagine that, right? That's not what most people think of with like a content warning or trigger warning. Um, sometimes it's about STIs, like that they have, you know, that they have herpes and they've had it for a long time and it's a, you know, difficult thing for them either for physical reasons like pain or social reasons um, and, and that's a tricky class for them. So I've just learned, I've been teaching human sexuality for 16 years, it's not predictable. I'm just open to all students and their experiences in their lives and support them wherever they're at. Um, but uh, no students lose their minds. Um, taking human sexuality, and I think they get a lot out of it, and I wish we started comprehensive sex ed a lot earlier in life, and for parents who, parents or caregivers or guardians raising kids, it is never um, too late to start using accurate words and talking about all of this stuff. Hi. Uh, uh, this is a, a question across the panel. Um, what do you think of the notion of we live in a society that because of the internet, I think that people are starved for touch. And so when they have the opportunity to be sexually engaged, they go for the, the end game, right? Without any of the emotions or any of the things that they actually need and how that's possibly doing more damage and short, continuing to short circuit uh, the touch that people really need and really starve for. Does it make sense as a question? It does. I mean, I don't know that I've spoken to people who I would say are sort of jumping to the end game, but I do think that if you're not used to being touched physically, it can be an overwhelming sensation and probably a source of anxiety. I remember when I was interviewing Debbie for this piece, at one point I asked her sort of what advice would you have for somebody who for whatever reason isn't as comfortable with their sexuality as they would like to be. And she had a really simple, and I thought compelling answer, which was like, it's kind of basic stuff. It's the stuff that we need sort of outside of our sexual selves. Like take care of yourself, like sleep more, exercise more. If you're not comfortable getting touched, get massage, like get back in the swing of that. I don't know. And dance, get your shit together. <laughs> you know, but, like, but yeah, I, mean, I think that there are many things that we want in life. I think that um, there's a notion that they um, uh, called skin hunger, right? Which is that we all have some some craving for touching and being touched. And um, you know, some people do that really well. Like I've had some students who get some needs met while they're while they're figuring out all the like interpersonal dating, hooking up, love, sex, whatever stuff. They get those needs met with like a pet, all right? Or like working in like a preschool and volunteering. I mean, like there's really all these other ways that sometimes people just feel like I can get connection to other living beings um, while I figure this stuff out. Saul Gordon, a now deceased sex educator, was really big on the massage thing and just, you know, other kinds of touch. Um, and this for me jumps back to the defining sex as vaginal intercourse for the vast majority of people for whom opposite sex sex is sex that if you crave touch and you crave sex and you believe sex is vaginal intercourse, you will jump to that and skip everything else that may provide you with the warmth and comfort and intimacy and connection and, and satisfy that skin to skin hunger that can lead up to that or actually take its place. Like one of the things that I think is very beneficial for young people to hear and I'm often saying to them is you don't have to have penetrative sex, anal or vaginal, to have an adult sexual experience. 
that a lot of adult sex, particularly a lot of same-sex adult sex, is mutual masturbation and rolling around and maybe a little bit of oral sex and just really feeling each other and connecting. And if you don't regard penetrative sex as the be-all, end-all, and ultimate goal uh, that you're gonna rush to in every sexual encounter, I think you're less likely to get people um, you know, running roughshod over each other to, to get to that and then leaving people with uh, vulva, vulva fissures? Vulva, vulva fissures. <laughs> that I've word never vulva has tripped you up as long it as I've known you. <laughs> it doesn't roll off my tongue somehow. <laughs> So, um, really, really wonderful discussion that we're having here tonight. Um, my name is Justin Smith. I am a, a recent graduate of Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And doing this type of work in the South comes with very uh, specific challenges, as you can all imagine. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how do you advocate for sort of comprehensive sex education that's affirming of uh, kind of queer youth in conservative environments, um, and what can that look like? So like, we know that we need to affirm kind of queer youth, trans youth, um, and provide education that helps them lead healthy sexual lives as well, but how do you do that in environments that are hostile to their very lives? How do we do that? Surreptitiously. <laughs> I, I don't know how you do that. You can barely provide decent sex education in that environment to straight kids, which, you know, in, a, in an environment uh, or a, a place that's dominated by people who wish queer people didn't exist or believe that we don't exist, providing comprehensive sex education that centers pleasure, and pleasure is always centered in queer sex because we aren't having reproductive sex really often, uh, if at all <laughs> ever, um, is nearly impossible. Um, because there's the fantasies that religious conservatives have about sex and then there's sex. And sex is a fact and a reality. And sex predates uh, all of our cultures. Sex is, what, a half a billion years old? Um, sex built us, it's building what's ever coming after us, and it doesn't care about our imaginary sky friends. <laughs> and how do you say that to someone who thinks not just sex education, but everything should be bent uh, in service of well, to, to, to service their irrational beliefs. How do you say that in that community? I don't know. I say this where I live and I get away with it. Um, and I put it on the internet so that kids in that community can read it. And I hear all the time from kids uh, in the Deep South who, uh, and more conservative places, Spokane, Washington is practically the Deep South, um, who access the information that they need because it's more easily available online than it ever was. Parental controls, uh, and the ability of like your, your pastor, or your youth pastor, to control what you have access to is so limited now that rather than trying to shape the message to appease the craziest, most sex negative parent or, or church, just put the message out there and trust that kids who are so motivated will find it. Yeah, I'm from the deep south. I got the information. Because <laughs> I grew up with the internet. Right. Yeah, it's all out there. Thank you, guys. Um, so my question, you've all spoken about how touch and intimacy and tenderness is so positive. Uh, but we're living right now in an era where on college campuses or in, um, in jobs, in, in job settings, et cetera, there's so much sensitivity about not touching, um, about making sure that we're really, really clear about every word we use and every touch we do or don't, or do, uh, make in any kind of way. So on college campuses or in uh, work settings, maybe more in college campuses or schools, how are we educating kids when you kind of do want them to have the intimacy of just nice touch, <laughs> like gentle touch, but we're also, the whole media is saying you can't touch anybody. How do you balance that? Well, to be clear, I'm not saying it even has to be gentle. Like some of them like rough and that's fine, right? Like rough, gentle, like whatever. But I want them to be able to figure out what they want, um, what they like, what feels good to them to explore that and to be able to get that. So. Um, I don't actually see them having that much trouble. I think that there's, some, there's sometimes a perception 
in the wake of Me Too that everybody's really freaking out and nervous, but I don't see that, actually. Um, I do see with sexual assault, so our data actually show that very few men are actually worried about being unfairly accused of sexual assault. Um, a lot more women and, um, and gay and bisexual men are worried about being assaulted um, than any <laughs> proportion of men who are worried about being unfairly accused. Um, so, so yeah, I think that, you know, the, the thing is that the research are really clear that about 85 to 90% of young men and women want connection, want intimacy, would prefer to date, would prefer to be sexual with somebody they like, like across the board. We found this, other researchers find this. What I always tell my students though is that like they need to start saying this to each other because they say it privately to me in papers, they say it in surveys. They talk about like how much they just want to find somebody who like they like to hang out with and like and be sexual with that person too. But like they think that everybody around them only wants to hook up and doesn't actually want to be with somebody who they like at all. Um, but they need to talk about that with each other. So, you know, I'm lucky I teach a human sexuality class so we can have these conversations and I have all sorts of like little exercises we do that support them in that. I'm really glad I don't teach math, where that would probably be, be like a weirder thing to do, <laughs> where I would probably be very scared about being like accused of harassment or something. But um, I'm, you know, but I'm on a college campus. I teach human sexuality. Um, if you're in a, you know, high school in Georgia, no, like that's going to be harder. High schools in Indiana, they're more challenging. And so yes, I think like we need the internet sex education. We need people just going back to their schools. I often tell my students, like, if you want to make change, go back to your community where you came from, the high school you went to, and meet with your principal. Meet with a school superintendent. And I have some students that have done that, have gone back and saying, the sex education I had or lack of it failed me, and this is what my friends and I needed, and can we change that? Um, even like for LGBTQ folks, like we've had like a lot of young people in our state who one of the professors organized this thing, and they go back like through their old high schools in Indiana as like a panel and talk about what they needed when they were in high school at their old high schools, um, like to the students who are there now, and that's in Indiana. So I'm hopeful that you know things like that can happen, but they do take people organizing it and doing it, and it takes an awful lot of work and some right people to open doors for you. Um, question here. Um, how do we find the balance about speaking about it without making it such a big deal? Like now that I'm in my 40s, I miss my 20s when it was just, just easy to have sex. Now it feels like it's complicated and you have to have all sorts of conversations and it's politicized and stuff. Is there a way to have a conversation about it without making it such a big deal that everyone's terrified of it and we're like stepping on eggshells? I'd really love simple sex to come back. <laughs> well, I think in your 20s, you usually had a group of like intimates around you that you felt comfortable just being open with, and those relationships often fall away as life gets more complicated and stressful, as you have a, a relationship of marriage, if you become a parent, that kind of intimacy with friends that you can just be really love with about like what you're doing and what you like and goes away, and so you have to consciously curate those relationships for yourself. You have to make an effort to keep that kind of connection, not even with people you're partnering with sexually, but people you can be open with about your sex life, sexual interests, sexual activities. Those are the, 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 those are the people that fall away. And often in your 20s, when you're first experimenting, you're first learning about yourself uh, sexually, that's when you're most likely to endlessly talk about yourself sexually, because uh, it's helping you frame and understand yourself. Because you, because explaining yourself to someone often means you're explaining yourself to yourself and coming to a better understanding of yourself. Um, and you do that less the older you get. Uh, and I'm old, so I know. Um, and I've had to, you know, I have, I make an effort to have people in my life that I can still be that open with and initiate those kind of conversations when they're welcome on both ends, as opposed to just blurting that out like you often did in your twenties. Um, so for. Hi. <laughs> so you guys talked a lot about the different ways that you can kind of do better as parents, but there's so much research on how to raise a drug-free kid, how to raise an alcohol-free kid, which is good I luck. Mean, what it is. <laughs> but how? What is? What's the kind of statistics and methods that you found to raise the most sexually healthy kid? 
Well, <laughs> you're not looking. What? So I'm not sure that there really is a straightforward answer to this. I don't know, Debbie. I mean, do you? So yeah. I mean, it's I mean, not like I mean, it's not like step by step like how to build a desk, right? Yeah, but right. But, it, <laughs> but I mean, but the general idea is like <clears throat> you know to have a conversation and not the talk, right? So ongoing. Yeah. yeah. So like since ongoing and unwelcome. <laughs> Your kid is not going to want to have that conversation Actually, yeah, with I, you. You know, this is interesting to me as a parent of younger kids. I have a five-year-old and a nine-year-old. That in conversations with other parents about like how should children be taught how babies are made, it turns out like first of all, there's very little, at least in my exploration, like good literature about this. The books for kids are not very good, in my opinion. No offense if anyone's written one. Um, and what's really weird is there's this idea that's really pervasive among parents that I've encountered that you should wait until they ask, and then you should answer only what they ask. So if they ask, where do babies come from, you say they're made of a sperm and an egg. And if you're four years old and that makes no sense, like, tough, you know? <laughs> Basically, they have to get to the point where the, the, the current sort of parenting thing is where they can <laughs> ask a question that they don't have the information to ask, right? Right. And so how is a baby, I mean, how is a four-year-old or a five-year-old or a nine-year-old going to know what to ask? And there's no other topic as a parent that I would approach that way, right? I wouldn't say, like, well, actually, like, I'm going to wait for you to ask about tolerance or all these other sort of important values, and then I'm going to teach you those things when you unlock the, the, the sort of the, the lock with the, just exactly the right pass, passcode. So I think one answer is sort of what Dan just said. What did you say? You said unwelcome and ongoing, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I have a 21-year-old son, um, and he is uh, straight and had the gayest parents. That religious art, the religious <laughs> rights opposition to gay people adopting because we'd make our kids gay. If my husband Terry and I couldn't make a kid gay, nobody can make a kid gay. <laughs> <laughs> like, but we, you know, it was my experience talking to him that we did, he'd want to talk to us about it, anything, and I knew that I had to talk to him about it. And I would say to him, like, we would go on, like, I don't drive, so we would go on a walk so we didn't have to look each other in the eyes. It's one of the pieces of advice they often give parents when you're going to have a sex talk with your kids is go for a drive so they don't have to, like, make eye contact and be embarrassed. So we would go on a hike, and we would, and I would do a down, I didn't, it wasn't a conversation, it was a download. Here are all the things that I think you need to know. And he would go, shut up, I don't want to talk about it. I know it already, Dad. And I would say, I... You might know it already, but I know for sure that you would say you knew it already to avoid this conversation. <laughs> so the sooner you let me say all this, the sooner we're done. <laughs> and I would do the download. Now my sample size is one. Like maybe but, uh, you have different kids. You, who, you really do have to force it, I think. And I, I talked to multiple people who told me weirdly the exact same anecdote when I asked them about their conversations with their parents, where they said, like, not only did I not have conversations with my parents, when I had to bring home a permission slip from school saying we're doing sex ed, I faked my parents' signature because I couldn't even bear to have them know that I was receiving sex ed because I thought that they might use that as an occasion to talk to me. <laughs> it's li like literally, it's like violation. It's like violating even the, like the concept loosely in the margins around the edges about consent. I had non-consensual conversations with my kid about sex <laughs> that he did not want to have. That he withdrew his consent to have these conversations, and I still talked to him about everything I thought he needed to know which included consent, which considered, included pleasure, which included masturbation. And because I'm me, included things that like most parents wouldn't think to talk to about their kids. Traumatic masturbatory syndrome. Like I know that there are some boys out there who put their penises between mattresses and box springs to masturbate and then can't ejaculate during partnered sex because the inside of a person doesn't feel like a crusty mattress laying on a crusty box springs. And so I told him that and he was like, shut up! <laughs> But if he had wound up doing that and I could have prevented that, how guilty would I have felt? <laughs> There's also a really, not to move and away from the And don't tweet anything I'm saying about my kid because it'll murder me. Um, there was also a really terrific curriculum called Our Whole Lives that um, was developed by sex therapists and sex educators decades ago and is offered through Unitarian churches. Don't you don't you have to be a member of a Unitarian church. I know some people that like never go to any services of any kind but would like drop their kid off every Sunday for like 
the Unitarian sex ed, basically. <laughs> and, um, and it's a really great cur curriculum. There's actually the high school portion of it is used in the most effective college, sex ed college sexual assault prevention program known so far. And so that's like a very important. Um, it's the closest we that. get in America to what the Dutch do in their grade schools. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's so, I mean, that's just another possibility that our whole lives, the OWL program. Yes. If we are out of time. I'm sorry. Thank you for being such a great crowd. Thank you for actually asking questions. <laughs>